get right into our Seahawks segment, Bell, and take yeah. a look at that tough loss to Tampa Bay, who, you know, if they end up going through the rest of this year and they're firing on all cylinders, I'll feel a little bit less bad mm -hmm. about this, but just you came out flat in the first half. So let's look to uh, that game in Munich, Germany. Yeah. Like you said, unfortunately, that was a loss. Um, the Seahawks came up short. They lost 21 to 16. They did have a second half effort there. Um, I unfortunately did not make it to wake up at 6 30. I don't blame you. So I caught the second half of the game, but I'll go ahead and send it back over to you to ask what you saw in that first half and what kind of went wrong. Yeah. I mean, so a few things that, you know, you come into this game that had been like mainstays for these two teams throughout the, uh, mainly the first half of the season, you know, Tampa Bay had been historically bad at running the football 32nd in the league in yards per game. Yeah. And they crushed that like through the first half, <laughs> Leonard Fournette. And I think it's Rashad, right? Mm -hmm. Rashad white. Rashad white yeah. um, I think Rashad white eventually did leave with an injury, but Leonard Fournette, uh, Munich Lenny was able to do his thing on the ground and kind of set up Tom Brady and their offense uh, to find Julio Jones for a touchdown on the first half. Uh, so yeah, being able to, it was like, I said it pretty early on in the game. I said, if you're able to hold them to a, their poor run game, you know, you should be able to be able to minimize what Tom Brady is able to do. And they were able to run the ball on you after this defense, you know, for the last few weeks has really looked improved and they just could not stop the run. It was really, uh, disappointing to see that. And then the offensive side of the ball, you know, we talk about Geno Smith, how efficient he's been, how much of a pocket presence he's had. It just wasn't, wasn't there. there. You know, Kenneth Walker wasn't able to get anything going in the first uh, first half. And really in general, I mean, if we looked at his numbers in the box score, it was pretty poor. DK had a couple nice long receptions, but that's like, that's what it felt like all you had um, in the first half. And I believe it was in the first half he got the unsportsmanlike conduct penalty uh, that pushed the Seahawks back from a standard, uh, like a 40-yarder, a field goal to a 55 Jason Myers still made it but it was interesting you know I I, I try I tend to lean on the uh to the side of the players with stuff like this because mm -hmm. you know it's yeah, like the DJ Moore catch uh that he had against the Falcons where he took his helmet off he's celebrating a big catch that's a big moment yeah it's a big it's a big play you know um but it was interesting because I guess DK said something and he pointed at the ref and by rule, by what the referees were saying is if once you make it personal towards the ref, it becomes a flag. So I don't know. I just think that was kind of odd. I mean, it didn't end up hurting them in the long run because they got the three points there regardless. Uh, but first half just looked like your offense, which had been, you know, has been pretty darn good for most of the season, fell flat on their face in the first half. And the defense wasn't able to stop the run. So it was like, you were you guys left in the hotel? <laughs> yeah, it was that was a tough first half. Uh, like you said, they did find a way to come up late. Tyler Lockett had a touchdown. Marquise Goodwin had a touchdown. Um, but yeah, it was that first half kind of, doom, kind of dooms you. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, this, I said this after the game, and I felt like the wee hours of the morning, but I had been up since five anyway. So that was. You know, my my perception was changed. Um, that this team technically is still uh, overperforming. Yeah. Right. So I'm not mad at it. You know, this Tampa Bay team it still has a ton of talent. Uh, Chris Godwin is still getting back to his full self. Mike Evans is still Mike Evans. Tom Brady's seeming to find some sort of rhythm. Mm -hmm. Their defense has a ton of talent. Vita Vea. Uh, oh shoot, what's his name? Uh, 45 on their defense. I know they have Levante David still. Devin White, they got a ton of talent on that defense as well. So, I mean, it's a good team, you know, just after what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had shown throughout the most part of the season, you kind of figure how we've been going, hey, we should be able to win this one. And just the way you started was really poor, just really poor. So it was tough to wake up at 5 in the morning, try to get my bearings, and then watch that at 6.30 because it was like this uh, yeah. first half was bad. Second half started to play a little bit better. Tariq Woolen had a pick. We'll get to that. Yeah. But 
yeah, just a tough one. But now you go into the bye week, try to recenter yourself um, for for Las Vegas. I almost said Oakland. I mean, maybe you get that loss out of the way. You were on a streak there. You won a few games, so it felt like maybe it was coming. And of course, we didn't want it to come, um, and we sure didn't want to lose a game in Germany where there were several Seahawks fans. So um, unfortunate, but we'll get to our players of the game here. For offensive, I went with Geno Smith, who really shrug off that um, bad first half, uh, went 23 for 33, 275 yards, those two touchdowns um, to lock it in Goodwin, and 22 rushing yards for himself. So. Yeah, the first half was pretty bad. I mean, even in the second half, there was an unfortunate moment where he lost a fumble, but it yeah. really looked like he looked more like how he's been playing the season in the uh, second, in that second half. half. Yeah, and I'm not worried about him. There was the report that came out earlier, excuse me, in that morning that the Seahawks uh, do want to extend him, and mm -hmm. we'll get to that in team news. And there, I got a few comments. You know, when we post news like that. Sure enough, there will be comments. We're like, oh, not after this. I'm like, it's it was one half. One bad. I'm not yeah. worried about it, you know. And I don't know. I'm. I'm I will talk about it when we get to team news. That's. that's <laughs> I. Uh, you know, I could have gone with Gino as well because nobody else stuck out too yeah. far. I went with DK just because of those first few catches he had. It's really like, all right, you're able to. You're getting the ball to DK. Um, and we'll like to see more, but still not a bad uh, stat line at six receptions, seventy one yards. Uh, there were several plays where he got the ball in space and he just ran right at a defender. Oh, yeah. That's who he is, you know. So I'd like to see that more going forward, uh, seeing more of that balanced offense, being able to get the ball to a guy like Ken Walker, while also being able to look at your receiving core like DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Marquise Goodwin's been able to produce. Mm -hmm. uh, so, And then your tight ends. Uh, so, yeah, I don't blame you at all going for Gino. And the defensive side of the ball, mentioned his name mm -hmm. earlier, <laughs> uh, was wondering if he'd get another pick. Wonder if he'd get off one off Brady. Wasn't Brady, but Brady was involved in the play. I'm sure you saw it. I feel like it might have been even sweeter the way it happened <laughs> for Terry Quillen. So, I yes, that's my defensive player of the game this week again. <laughs> um, he did have that interception on Leonard Leonard Fournette's pass to Tom Brady. Uh, they were trying to do a trick play there, didn't go as planned. Brady kind of trips and you know the ball ends up in Terry Golan's hands. So that was just an odd play <laughs> to, to comment. Well, I, they, they kept showing that replay for like five <laughs> minutes in the game afterwards. And I was like, all right, I've seen it, you know, but he made a large divot where he had slipped and to comment on that, you know, uh, there was discussion about the field for this because Bayern Munich plays there. They're a, a, a football team, football, not American mm -hmm. football. Um, and there had been all this talk about prepping the field for the game, you know, because obviously it's different. Uh, you don't see guys like offensive linemen playing in soccer. It's not, you know, it's, there's more, it's different, different kind of cleats, different kind of movement on that field. And the NFL has had to foot the bill to repair the uh, field there in, no in, way. in Byron uh, because of how they left it. And a, a Bruce Irvin made a comment. He was, uh, he basically called it a bad field. Uh, he used different words, but I'll call it a bad deal. <laughs> uh, there were a bunch of comments about it from the players. Tyler Ott, the long snapper, made a comment. Just interesting. You know, I'm not, there's no blaming the play on it here, but it's just like, oof. You know, you want to be able to talk about player safety. Um, and this, well, there's been some talk too about player safety with turf. I think we'll talk there about it. Yeah. But it was just interesting to see that, that the NFL has to like, hey, sorry, we, here's the Sorry, we deposit. ruined your field. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> Interesting to see that, but you've got a stat here to go back to it on yes. Tariq about his interceptions, and that's a pretty solid list to be on. He now has five this season and ties Earl Thomas and Michael Bulware for the most by a rookie in franchise history. So continues to add to his accolades for the year, and yeah, I just don't see any slowing down from him. So expect him to be on this list <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, I mean, and it's not like any fault to you for picking him either just because of the success that he's had. Uh, you know, I know that a few lists have gone out uh, with – it feels weird with midseason because we used to have 16 games. You could say eight weeks in. Now it's the 17 and you have to pick. It's I don't like it. Um, but they had – the NFL had himself and Ken Walker in the top 10. And it's hard to disagree with yeah. that. You know, it's really hard to disagree with that. And it's just – 
again, this was a guy that was mostly considered a project for the Seahawks when he was taken in the draft and through training camp to an extent, and he continues to perform. Uh, I went with what I would go call the safe pick. Uh, <laughs> Jordan Brooks continues to rack up tackles, 14 mm -hmm. total, 11 solo, one tackle for loss, one pass deflection. The pass deflection kind of should have been an interception. Brady threw it right at him, but Brooks was more in the kind of batted yeah. out. Um, Motion, which is fine, yeah. but it's it's nice to see that he continues to rack up tackles. He's in the top five in the NFL consistently for uh, total tackles. So it's tough not having Bobby Wagner, but uh, and that's a whole different discussion. But it's incredible to think that, you know, I know last year, uh, both of those guys, it's like Bobby and Jordan were both like racing each other to be the NFL tackle leader. Um, and Jordan only overtook him because Bobby got injured in that game against Chicago, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so he, he continues to produce. You know, I, I know that I've seen comments like they want to see. I think they want to see more flashy plays, maybe interception, big hit. But uh, if you can continue to produce, I'll, I'll take it. I'll absolutely take it. Even Cody Barton made an impact. And I know I've been tough on tough on him. He got an interception on his birthday. So good for him, you know. But yeah, I went with what I would consider the safe pick because I didn't want to copy and go with Tariq. So. <laughs> some would say that Tariq is the safe pick. So <laughs> we'll move on to some injury news here. Um, inactives against the Buccaneers were Jake Curran, Tony Jones Jr., Brian Moan, LJ Collier, and Tease Tabor. And injuries against the Buccaneers in the second quarter, wide receiver D. Eskridge was listed as questionable to return with a hand injury. It's not a broken hand, so not terrible news. <laughs> Big just side. tough with him. You know, because I know that we've talked about it. I've talked about it for weeks now. Wanting, to, wanting see more. to see more production. And, you know, they've put him on uh, kickoffs and I believe punts sometimes. Just still hasn't been able to make a splash play. Hasn't been able to really show what the team drafted him for so high. I say so high as a second rounder. But still, you know, uh, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, where did so-and-so get drafted? And you look at that draft and like, Seattle took him over, you know, like you look at some of the guys that were below him in the list and that's, that's on scouting. That's on what they see, but it's, it's tough because it's to an extent, it's like what we had with Rashad Penny for a while. We right. Didn't, it was like, all right, you've maybe shown even Rashad shown bits and pieces. I haven't seen much from Eskridge at all, you know? So it's like, when are we going to get that? And, you know, I know he's still on this rookie deal, but it's like that when, when these decisions come up, whether it's in the camp or whether it's in the heading into free agency, you know, whether to pick up an option to talk, bring, put a, put an offer on the table. It's like some, some of this stuff where you're not able to make an injury. You're not able to be available. I mean, not able to make a player, not able to be able to be available. It's tough. It makes my decision easier. Yeah. You know, or it should, but uh, obviously I'd like to see him in better health because obviously then if he's in better health, he can perform better <laughs> yeah, or perform at all. <laughs> Um, also your defensive player of the game, Jordan Brooks dealt with some cramps during the game. So don't need to lose a linebacker. <laughs> we'll move on to uh, some team notes as that covers the injury news here on the ninth, uh, GM John Schneider was nominated for a 2022 salute to service award. Schneider was nominated by the Seahawks for his continued dedication to the local military community. This includes throughout the year. Schneider also supports the team's year round commitment to the military community that includes inviting over 700 military service members to Seahawks home games, veteran support through our task force, 12 nonprofit organizations and unique opportunities for the entire military family. So way to support those who have served on the 13th, as you have teased, it was reported that the Seahawks will work with Gino to keep him past the season. So I'm not sure how, how much that was expected, but Seattle is expected to keep the QB as its starter into the future with a long-term contract offer this off season. Now, when you hear long-term and if I'm putting you in, we talked about John Schneider, John Schneider's shoes year wise, I'm not asking you money wise, cause that's his own thing, but year wise, what are you, I'm, if, if it's, it's interesting to use the, term long term because what does that mean right because you know he's not exactly young he's not exactly old right um it's kind of like you're in this middle area and i'm i'm thinking uh three years if you're talking long That's, yeah because I, if i was gonna say two to three but two is more short term i'd say three to four yeah so yeah it, I, I know that now well the prove me wrong and and didn't take malik willis with that pick where they took ken walker 
but I know that this upcoming draft is one that's pretty heavy with QBs. So maybe as opposed to going one with one in the higher rounds, maybe go with one in the lower rounds, you know, not to stay just say bias in a house. I'm really interested to see where Michael Penix ends up on draft boards, mm -hmm. but it just seems like now with that sort of comment and the way that Geno has been playing and the trust that this team has in Geno Smith, that the idea of a quarterback in any of the higher rounds is kind of off the table. If it had even been on the table, right? Because again, this is where we were like, Oh, they're starting Gino. I remember we talked about that when the decision was made. Um, I had my cold take. We got over that. Um, and it just seems like that's never necessarily been on the table for Seattle. So I'm just interested to see what this means. Cause to this point though, this is something that a lot of people talk about with Tom Brady, since we played the Buccaneers this past week, quarterbacks getting contracts that maybe price you out uh, salary cap wise of certain free agents, right. Or extensions for your other players, mm -hmm. you know? So I am interested to see what that looks like money wise, how they're able to spread that around and over how many years, you know, this long term is a very interesting comment for me. So yeah. I agree. You can chime in and let us know what you think long term means too. Cause yeah, it, like we said, three to three to four is what I thought, but even then, is that really that long? <laughs> um, we'll move on to uh, some league news here on the seventh, the Colts fired their head coach, Frank Reich, the team consultant and former multi pro bowl center. Jeff Saturday was named the interim head coach. So he did step in for Sunday's game. Um, he was also an ESPN analyst and had to leave the Monday recorded recording because he was named head coach. It looks like things went well for them because they did end up victorious over the Raiders yesterday. So, yeah, it's a really, I don't know. What, what do you think about it? Cause the guy was an analyst <laughs> on, I think it was good morning football or so, no, it was on ESPN's show. And I think he had uh, coaching experience in high school. He was a consultant with the Colts for the last like five years, I believe. And, you know, the, I know that he left the show recording, but he had to have been talked about this at some point before you'd think, right? Cause there's no way, Hey Jeff, I know you're all, you're doing a show today, <laughs> but we want to name you the interim head coach. Yeah. That's there's no way. Right. I mean, it's, it's just really interesting. There was also the comment that this kind of puts a bad spin on, you know, hiring uh, with the Rudy rule and getting, you know, those. Oh, good point. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's that's an interesting situation for me with Indianapolis because I have felt team wise, not necessarily staff wise for a long time, that if they get their quarterback, they get a guy that they can trust for years. they will be a Super Bowl contender with the way their defense is playing. If Jonathan Taylor is able to stick there could use maybe a few weapons on the outside. Yeah. Uh, their offensive line has a ton of talent. They just haven't been playing that way this year. And they've got stop gaps, you know, Carson Wentz, Matt Ryan. These are, these are stop gap guys. These aren't, you know, build the future kind of guys. So it's not the pick that I would have seen as a interim head coach. Um, normally they would, you know, coordinator. Yeah. Someone within the staff yeah. already. So it's definitely interesting, but I think it'll be more interesting to see how they move after this. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So also on the seventh, the uh, commander's potential buyers group is growing. They have added another well-known name. So Jeff Bezos and Jay-Z's bid for Washington has a new potential investor, Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> who is a very well-known actor. Yeah. <laughs> I know he's a big Texas Longhorns guy. So I, I as long as they get it away from Dan Snyder, I don't care. But it'd be interesting to see what they do with that franchise when they've all like pulled their money and they, you know, put their offer in. So eh. that's also an interesting group of guys there. Yeah. <laughs> you go, yeah, you said Jeff Bezos and Jay Z. I was like, that is a weird combo. And now Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> yeah, don't know how they all, you know, don't know what it'd be like in a bar with those. Three, but, yeah. Interesting for sure. On the tenth, the NFL and the Commanders are being sued. Um, attorney general says that Dan Snyder team and oh, sorry, NFL and Roger Goodell colluded to deceive the residents about workplace investigation. So not good news coming from Washington commanders anytime soon. <laughs> um, the, on the 12th, it was reported that there may be more NFL games in Germany. So maybe more six 30 start times. <laughs> um, commissioner Roger Goodell says that the league might expand on its current plan to play a game a year over the next four years in the country. So they may be seeing a lot more of football. I know the there. crowd was good 
you know, I don't know if you've seen any of the video following it. I did. Uh, yeah, the way the crowd was. I mean, it's, it's nice to see, but it's like, uh, I think the field would be one thing, but then also the travel is another because, you know, you yeah. don't want to just fly in like the day before, be extremely jet lagged. That's, what was that? I believe it's a seven hour flight or something like that. Got to be longer. more organized. Um, I believe it's nine hours. Ooh. I don't know. Something, it's, it's really long. Um, so factor comes into it because I know in the past few weeks, the NFL's talked about, we've, we've covered it on league news, talked about playing more games in London and having a division in London. In London. Yeah. So it's like, that's a lot of, I don't know. A lot I don't of know. expansion. It, there. I don't see the feasibility. Right? Yeah. Well, we'll revert back to our Seahawks here. They have a regular season standing of six and four first in the NFC West still. And as you mentioned, they are, on a bye week this coming week so we, rest we'll up probably do some looking at mid-season stuff yeah. next week okay but yeah bye week nice to get rested kind of take a step back uh nice to have a later one in the year because you get like week five it's like oh shoot i gotta play 12 more weeks um but yeah it just again if you told me going into the bye week we'd be first Six in the four. division and that the rams would be have a 10 percent chance to make the playoffs i would think you're a little bit funny and i might i might laugh a bit and they also lost a division game yesterday yeah, to arizona in their own house mm -hmm. yeah and might have lost something even bigger in cooper cups injury so 